It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Sarah Lane joins us along with Andy Anako and Don McAllister to talk about the latest Mac news, iOS 5.01, iTunes Match, and more. It's all coming up next. Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 273, recorded November 15th, 2011. iTunes Mismatch. MacBreak Weekly is brought to you by GoToMeeting with High Definition Group Video Conferencing. For your free 30 day trial, visit gotomeeting.com and use the offer code MACBREAK. And by Gazelle, the easy way to sell or recycle most any used electronic gadget from your home or office. Gazelle your used gadgets today at gazelle.com. And by PDF Pen. Go paperless and easily correct, edit, and sign PDFs with the affordable PDF Pen Toolkit from Smile Software. For a free demo, go to smilesoftware.com slash MacBreak. It's time for MacBreak Weekly. We are ready to cover the latest Apple news with a fabulous group of people. Alex Lindsay is on assignment. Where is he, really? I think he's... And he's freedom fighting up and down the Congo. He's yeah, he's in, cafe, huh. in uh, Zuccotti Park. Uh, but right now, <laughs> joining us from Boston, Massachusetts, in the environs there, it's uh, Mr. Andy Inotko. Good to see you once again. Good to see you guys. I'm glad to see that the police could not shake you out of the Occupy Twitch Studios <laughs> movement. Fight the power. O W T S. You know, I'm reading uh, on your recommendation Roger Ebert's fabulous Life Itself book, and I'm on the reason I'm late. Steak and Shake chapter. Uh, in which, uh, yes. do you remember that chapter? He just goes on for a whole chapter about the magnificence that is Steak and Shake. Yeah, he, t he took me out to Steak and Shake once, I and it. I could tell that I was, <laughs> it was, it, it was like, it was like the, the cardinal taking you on a tour through a mm -hmm, cathedral. Mm -hmm. It's like, not, not, it, it, was, it was a great restaurant, it was a great lunch, but you could tell that, and this booth right here. <laughs> I almost like I almost want to like take off my hat, like hold up my hands, to not disrespect the steak and shake. He he he's a big fan of the steak I, and shake. I actually learned about steak and shake from Patrick Norton, who also I get apparently everybody who grew up in that area, Patrick uh, uh, is also from uh, well, I think Illinois area, but they, they just they're fanatical fanatical about it, and uh, and I I enjoyed it greatly, but I you know. Mm. But then, after listening to this chapter, I'm, I'm salivating. You know, I'm so, <laughs> sounds so good. Anyway, welcome, Andy. That other laugh over there is all the way from Liverpool. He is our uh, token Northern Englander, Mr. Don McAllister <laughs> of ScreenCast Hello, Online. Thank Hi. you for inviting me yet again. There, you know, he, what he says is, just as the, as the Brit loves his bangers and mash, mm -hmm. I love my steak and shake. Bangers and mash. Can't beat it with a bit of gravy. Nice, mm, lovely. The only thing, now I like bangers and mash, but there is also a, 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 what is it called, egg bun or bacon, bacon bun? Um... Bacon bun. Yeah, well, we Disgusting. do have like bacon rolls. And stuff, bacon roll, it? disgusting. Bacon roll. Yes. Oh, on, well, just don't get it on a train. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was my don't mistake. Go. Bacon you buddy. Bacon on British Rail. No, no, no bacon, bacon buddies. No. And then finally, and we're so glad to have her. I don't think you've ever been on Mac Break. I you? haven't. Sarah Lane, a host of iPad Today and Tech News Today on and and the Social Hour. That's true. See, I don't want to work you. You already got th you know daily show, two weekly shows, one more show. I just thought it'd be too much you for you. You underestimate my commitment. I like it. To the twitodial arts. And she brought her twit hanky. That's, that's not mine. I was that's just in there. That was, yeah, sure. Don't deny it. Okay, fine. I saw it fall out of your sleeve. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> welcome it's to Mac Break. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Mac Break Weekly. I think we have pens to go with it. Keep your iPad clean. So I, there's two big things happen today, at least. Uh, one is the Kindle Fire. We'll get to that in a minute because we have one here. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other, and I think that I, wanted, I want to do this first, is mm -hmm. Music Match launched yesterday. And I want to talk to you guys because I am already having some issues with it. I turned it on on my desktop where all my 46 gigabytes of music are stored um, and paid the 25 bucks. And it took it didn't take very long to scan my library. And I think as I left for work, it was now kind of starting to do something, matching. I don't know what it's doing. But I'm a little concerned because then I also turned it on on my iOS devices, on my iPad and my iPhone. And I was listening to music on my iPhone that isn't on my iPhone. 
but it's making some mistakes. For instance, I was listening to what I thought was Frank Sinatra Witchcraft, and I got cake going the distance. So the deal with iTunes Match, I know, is that, and this is something that was concerning people, is uh, metadata freaks, people who you know really have their metadata yes. set a certain way, it will remember your original metadata. So even if you go ahead and get that 256 AAC version of a song that you already have, bring it back down, re-download it, so that you now have a better version of the song you started out with, it will not override your metadata. That's good. But, but I don't know where you got this Frank Sinatra stuff, but if your metadata was screwed up, iTunes isn't going to fix that for you, so that might be where the problem is. But it's playing cake. I don't well, see my how, point is <laughs> that's not yeah. good. Yeah, I don't. Know. And also, it's stuck I now. Heard that. It's stuck now. See this? I can't. It's not responsive. So, um, you sure you don't have? So, cake? did you turn it on? No, I actually haven't. Well, I have a sort I of guess a complicated what, music library and a different computer. I that guess I never what I'm use. saying to people is maybe we sh cake has a song called Frank Sinatra. Oh my God, my world's colliding. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, that was not the song that it played, so no. now I'm really confused. Um, but I'm just saying that maybe we should wait. It's only been out a day, and wait and see and hear the howls of pain before we jump into it. Andy, I presume you jumped into it yesterday. I jumped into it on the sort of like sandbox machine that I use for things that I really can aff things that I can really afford can't afford to go wrong. So a wise I'm, man, a I'm, wise I'm leaving. Man. I'm leaving for like two and a half days tomorrow. And if all my music that gets synced to all my like mobile devices gets screwed up, that's going to be a long three days, Leo. Uh, so I, I gave it. A, I gave it a small library of about 800, 900 songs. It worked right. okay. It was actually the same library that I've been testing it with uh, in the various developer previews. But it's just as you say, the proof is when millions of people start to use this all at the same time uh, when all of those little corner cases are going to get shaken out. Uh, the stuff that I was giving it wasn't the stuff that has been in my library f uh, by and large for uh, for 15 years. Right. Mostly it was stuff that I had already purchased through MP3 or ripped directly from CD. So it's, I, it, it's, it's a consistent story with Apple. As with iCloud, as with iOS 5, it's going to take a few weeks for all of the problems to shake themselves out. So that's why I think that's smart if you have a really big library to just hold off for a little while. iTunes Match wasn't even out. I mean, it was, what, three hours before Apple said we're throttling back subscriptions because the demand yep. is so yeah. high yeah. yesterday? Whenever you see stuff like that, I just think, I'll wait, wait. a week. Now, Don, and the only reason I, I say how bad it is is because I don't want Don to feel bad because it's not available yet in the, in the <laughs> that's UK. That's right, that's right, yeah, yeah, unfortunately. And I know there are some people who've got uh, U.S. accounts uh, unofficially, but uh, normally when you have a U.S. account and you're not in the U.S., it's normally um, iTunes cards and things that you populate it with. But unfortunately, you can't actually sign up for an iTunes Match account or, or pay for iTunes Match without a valid U.S. credit card. Right. So there won't be very many people outside of the U.S. having access to it. But I did think, though, that when, when it kicks off and it, it matches your your library, it doesn't actually do anything to the music on your hard disk, does it? It doesn't do anything to the music Unless locally. Unless you download it. Yeah, but so if, if you're playing something off the cloud, there might be a mismatch, but unless you delete it from your local hard disk and right. then re-download it, I think you're probably well, going to be my okay. That would that's be my correct. concern, is what yeah. if, you know, yeah, I'm streaming it, okay, not a, not a horrible thing, but what if I say then download everything you match and it replaces my Frank Sinatra witchcraft? Yeah, that's something you need to be careful of, I think. Yeah, iCloud's music match is mostly a feature for iOS devices. It saves you the trouble of having to put so many multi-gigabytes of your music into the cloud so you can then pull it back down again through iOS. Well, and then I also... I did, hear, go ahead. I did hear that you can actually, if you've got low-quality music on your local drive and it matches it and it matches it correctly, you can actually download the higher quality. So you can yeah. delete the low, the low bitrate version and then yes, download the which high. is great for anybody except people who are lossless fans because right. it won't give you. Then you're screwed. Then you're actually downgrade. So I guess the, uh, I guess we all agree. Our, our advice would be uh, move slowly, and if you have spent a lot of time on uh, your music library, you might want to set it aside uh, and and then maybe make a copy or something. Because now here's the other thing: I'm I am streaming it, so it's recognized all my songs. And it's got, I mean, here's some oddball stuff I've got on here, but it, but I, but now it's frozen up because it just won't play. It's not really streaming, right? Isn't it? It's temporary no. downloads. I'm not sure what it is. It says it won't do it on 3G, and now it's just unresponsive while it tries to get this song played. You see, it sees 8,900. I mean, this is nice. I, I, I didn't have to load anything on my iPod or my iPhone. It sees 8,933 songs. It just, but it just doesn't, it doesn't. It just, 
philosophically it works the same way as the uh, purchased mu music you've already, you've already purchased tab in the iTunes store and right. the iOS app works. So it's not so much that it's streaming so much as it's saying, oh, I guess he wants that on this device now. I'll download it and well, add so it to the device So if I listen library. to it, so, oh, okay, now that's, that's an important point. So if I now listen to it, it will, because uh, I can listen to anything in my library, whether it's on my thing or not. That's a sin signal to download it in full and keep it. Is that right? I have to. I, I I haven't gone through the full like point by point bullet point test. It did. It, it worked that way in in versions that I've been testing earlier. Tim Cook said specifically that the or Apple. I'm sorry. Apple site says said specifically as of a couple of weeks ago that this is not a streaming service. It's a download service. Right. But I haven't. That said. Uh, my hands were full with like updating like my uh, my Kindle Fire review over the weekend. So essentially, it was oh damn, today's the day that's going to drop. Thank you, Apple. <laughs> do do enough so I can see how it works in case someone asks me about it uh, over the course of the next week. Uh, but I've haven't I'm res reserving a full investigation for another week or so. I think as I understand it, it's there's some sort of a temp cache where you actually do download the song because it gets them around having to figure out streaming mm, uh, situations right. with you know the the big uh, it appears music to stream. Right. right. Well, it, but what it, it's, it's it like it has a small cache that just it. things just get And I think out. for a normal user the the distinction between streaming and downloaded and play while you download and cash and play while you download is completely elusive. Right. Right? I mean, it's streaming. I mm -hmm. press play, it plays. I don't really care what the difference is as long as my iPhone, iPad, iOS device doesn't slow down because it's getting well, bogged and down. That's the problem. I'm you know, hard right to Even on our very fast Wi Fi, yeah. I'm in the music player and I'm stuck on this cut, uh, which yeah. is an iTunes cut. Merlin Mann bought this for me. Coil and Sharp, Burn Your Bag, from the mm -hmm. fantastic album, These Two Men Are Imposters. And, you know, it's just stuck there. And it's been stuck there since uh, for half an hour. Well, have, have you... Have I what? Have, <laughs> have I what? I mean, what if you hard restart? All right. And I mean, by the way... I, I hate to suggest that, but well, sometimes and then, that helps. And that's another issue, because I've been... Uh, with iOS 501, I have had to do a lot of hard restarting lately. Have you? Yeah. Yeah. Have you too, Andy? Have, see, now, look, I, I force closed, and I'm in the right. same spot. Uh, so oh, I don't yeah. Have to yeah, oh, no, here it goes. Oh, oh well, at least it's, it's interrupting. There you go. Yeah. It's playing. I mean, it's, it, it's not working like the like uh, Kindle uh, MP3 store streaming works, in which you press a button, there's like a slight delay while it fills up the buffer and then starts playing immediately, right. and it just plain works. But so. Now, so to make the point, the, none of these songs are on my iPhone, and they are playing. Maybe they're downloading too. But what's the distinction from the point of view of the end user between this and streaming? It's playing as soon as yeah. I press play, well, and it's not on my stuff. And That's it's also, I mean, you were playing, what, Journey, Open Arms a second ago. You're not going to find that in your playlist on your iPhone. Ah, now. that's a good question. Will I? No, because that's not what people are looking for when they have their music right. backed up in the cloud. So... Now I'm stuck playing White Christmas by the Swingle Singers, and I do apologize. <laughs> so this is what happens: is on my list here, stuff that's not on my on my phone. It's got a little little download cloud, just as it does in iTunes. But you could download to your phone through the cloud. It's just not by pressing that button. Yeah, but that's just mm. not uh, the default situation. What was the Journey song? Do you remember? Open Arms. Open Arms. What a great tune. Let's oh. see. Let's go right now Softly to Open Arms. Softly, he was. <laughs> Now, now, where this is not streaming, this is bad singing. Okay, open arms. Is there no search feature? <laughs> is there, you just is there no search no feature? Is there no search? Are there no poor houses? I don't know. Open or you arms. Could... Oh, now see, it shows that it's there. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, see, so... it's not. And the, I can like, guarantee uh, you that was not on my iPhone. <laughs> yeah. Again, Apple said it's, it's you're, you're right, though, Leo. It's, 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 an, it's, a, it's a subtle distinction. Apple has said it's not a streaming service, but if you press, if you select something, press play, it starts playing. That's right. I think uh, maybe that's just a legal thing so that Apple can say, no, we're not licensing right. this for streaming. We're right. licensing it just for, for sharing. Right. They're just letting you play it while you, while you right. download it. Yeah. It's not streaming for the benefit purposes of the music industry. <laughs> for everyone else, it's streaming. But <laughs> as we all know, the music industry, stupid. <laughs> They'll be fooled by this little ruse. Um, all right. Well, so uh, I guess uh, wait and see. What is our advice with music, Matt? Well, okay. So la what about the people? I don't know how many songs you have in your library. I Almost 10,000 songs. Okay. So I have fewer than 25,000 songs also. That's the yeah. limit. It, right. 
Uh, there are definitely feathers ruffled by people who have very large libraries who say this is not helpful. Oh, please. To me. If you have 25,000 plus songs. <laughs> oh, in please. one library. In one library. Yeah. Oh, please. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you, are you impersonating somebody or is that no, really what you're No, just cry me a river. I'm saying, oh, please. Come on. Really? That, that now you're pissed off because for $25 a year, it won't replace all 25,000 songs well, in your library? No, I'm not pissed off because it doesn't apply to me. But, but I somebody have is? seen others who are, yes. Somebody is. Yes. Well, I know. I mean, by the way, Google has exactly the same limit, right? 25,000 songs. So it seems I think pretty, so. That seems like a lot of music. Now, the songs that you purchase through iTunes will not count against the, that number. So many oh, of the people well, who are sad. complaining actually may not be as upset as they think they are. Yeah. But if you had maybe a huge CD collection, for example, and it wasn't stuff, it's there's a, there's a gray area. It's kind of on a case by case basis, we which need... sort of makes this whole thing feel non y because it's confusing. It is a little complicated. Yeah, there have been a lot of missteps, missteps like that over the past few months between things that have, things involving developer sandboxing, things involving iCloud, this. There's a lot of lack of elegance that's happening in Apple products that we're just not used to. Yeah. Yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? I think some of that, though, is the scale of it, though, isn't it? I mean, they've done so much in the past three months. You've got to cut them some slack. Yeah, true. But, but they're, they're, historically, they're the company that says, we're going to do the one, th the one subcomponent of this large plan that we know we can execute flawlessly so that by the time these phones ship, they won't ha people won't have third-party apps, but they will have stable apps that actually work. They'll have a platform, at least for the first year, that is stable and doesn't chew up battery in, in about 30 minutes. So it's just, I'm not, I'm not saying it's necessarily the death of Apple uh, uh, approaching, but it's interesting that we're dealing with all these little nitpicky problems that we're just not used to facing. It's, it's rare that you find that kind of a, it's rare that you find uh, people saying, oh, well, it, yeah, it's a great feature, but you don't want to use it for the next couple of weeks well, until I Apple can, shakes some you, of the bugs out. Maybe it's, maybe this is, there's a reason for this. It's a, 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 these cloud services, it strikes yeah. me that mobile me was equally confusing. iCloud is worse and also has kind of similar problems where you say, well, maybe you want to hold off syncing on mobile me and things like that. So maybe it's something about cloud services that just is more complicated, but it does strike me that this has happened before. Uh, mm -hmm. It is rare with Apple, but where it happened before was mobile me. You know? Oh, another cloud service, yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's just a complicated concept. I think it is because of syncing. See, that's the problem is you have copy. I have local copies. I have cloud copies. What is the relationship between the two? What will, yeah. will, will cloud copies replace my local copies? It's, that is an inherently, I think, confusing situation. So. Yeah, and also inherently dangerous because you no longer have, with iCloud, you have one copy of the truth that's on the server. And that if a sub device decides that no, actually, I actually you, iCloud is screwed up. I actually have the correct copy of this thing. Right. Then your your MacBook gets outvoted. Your your, your iOS that's device gets outvoted. Me. I don't so want witchcraft replaced by cake. As much as I love cake, I actually have these <laughs> yeah. go in the distance. Yeah. So I don't want two copies of it. One marked witchcraft by Frank Sinatra. And one marked yeah. cake. Oh, well, we talked about this. Are you about to turn it on? I see you went to the iCloud. Thing. Sure. Well, no. What what um I was going to point out was merge with iCloud. How storage and well, see the pro here's the problem is is that my iPad uses a different Apple ID right. than my iPhone and right. my the MacBook. That's another Pro problem. That I use That's the most confusing. often. That's yeah. always been an issue with iTunes. It's maddening. Right. Um. And, but yeah, I, what, what I was doing was I was getting into the iCloud settings where you can go into storage and backup and say, yeah, back up everything to the cloud. And I worry that people will stop locally backing up. And I really think you need to do both if you want to be yeah, safe. Absolutely. I do love the idea, though, of having one canonical copy, if, it can, if we can get it to work, canonical copy of my library in the cloud that I could play on all my iOS devices mm -hmm. and all my computers. Is it limited to five total or is it still five computers and an unlimited number of iOS devices? Didn't they make it all? Yeah, I think it's the, the five is just limited to the computers, I think. I don't think there's any limits on the iOS devices. Yeah. I might be wrong, but I haven't come across any limits on iOS. Yeah, that's how it used to be anyway. And mm. I, 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 I had some concern that may, you know, I, I'm seeing this five limit now a lot, and I'm just wondering if mm. maybe I have activated computers that I don't know about or something like well, that. Well, the, the problem is as well, you, you don't, you forget which five computers you've activated, and, and also exactly. we're, doing test, we're doing lots of testing and stuff. You <laughs> some know, the of number may of times. be gone. Chad, yeah, I'm saying least. ten iOS devices, five computers. Five computers, ten. Okay. So from okay. that's fair. Ninety-nine point nine percent of people, yeah. that would be sufficient. But the people who have more than twenty-five thousand songs and more than ten <laughs> iOS devices are going to hate this. They're going to hate. You're forgetting this. the point. <laughs> the one percent. Oh, one percent. <laughs>
Screw you. So, um, Andy, what, what what do you think? People should wait. People, I mean, I I love the idea. I'm worried about the execution. Uh, I think that I think you should definitely wait. Uh, I think that everybody's going to have some measure of difficulty just from the nature of the fact that if you've had this library for, you know, for 15, 20 years, uh, most, a lot of people started ripping CDs in like, what, 95, 96. Yeah. There are going to be a bunch of titles that just Music Match can't make head or tails out of, so that's going to be a problem. But I think it's mostly a case of waiting until the server load kind of drops down a little bit. You, you, this, is, this is the super flush phenomenon where uh, Music Match goes active and everybody wants to try it out right. all at once. Right. So I, do, I think that just by the nature of, of, of that, in two weeks' time, it's going to be a much smoother transition for most people. Wait, 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 wait. And I'm, I'm just curious. I'm watching the chat room, and I haven't seen Howls of Pain, but I'm wondering if that's because the chat room hasn't done it yet. Uh, or if uh, they haven't had any problems. So, uh, chat room. A couple of folks had chimed in when we first started the the topic. That they were that, having issues. No, that they weren't. Yeah. Um. So. Trust. It looks like a lot of people just haven't gotten. No on problems. It yet. No problems Neither here. I. I have six thousand CDs. Uh, Google Music, which I have been using as well, and I like it. Uh, Tucker says, "No way, I'm activating it until they roll iTunes Plus upgrade out uh, for something I can't." Uh, bandwidth caps, that's a big issue, of course, uh, especially uh, uh, in Canada and Australia. Um, did it without an issue, says 5124. The problem is, though, Wiped my entire a, library, says 1276. Tell us about that. Error hmm. 4001 consistently. That's probably a, a network error, right? Uh, no problem for me. Waiting for the Windows ME update. <laughs> it is not in Canada. It is U.S. only right now, although uh, they, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Don, but didn't they say it would be rolling out internationally at some point? Yeah, there's, there's no date, but uh, soon they said, yeah. The, the thing that worries me, though, is, is how do you know that it's worked? Because if you've got an, a, a huge library, I mean, I've got about 12,000 songs or something, but if, if I did the match, how do you know which ones it's matched correctly and how, how do you know which ones it's made mistakes on and how long will it be before you actually realize there are some mistakes? Right. You were the first person, Leo, to say that there was a match mistake yeah. between mm. Frank Sinatra and Cake. I haven't heard that before. Uh, but I believe uh, uh, that, uh, I'm, and I'm looking right now, that uh, our friend uh, Dwight Silverman for the Houston Chronicle says, watch out for potential gotchas on his column. Uh, there's one big caveat. If you enable it on your device and haven't fully synced your music with iCloud, the only music you see is what's on iCloud. In other words, it, it deletes the existing music. Um, he apparently has had some some issues. This is this is the thing that worried me as well. Can you see my computer? I was about to tell you I can't you see can't your computer. See it. Sorry. We always have that problem. I don't know why. Um, it, he there is a setting when you turn on iTunes Match on an iOS device that's a, that's a big red warning button that says iTunes Match will replace the music library on this device. Enable or cancel. And so that's a little bit of a confusion. Um, I haven't seen it delete anything. I was worried about my Audible books, for instance. I have a lot of Audible books. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I, I haven't seen it. It hasn't deleted anything yet, to my knowledge. So I'm not, I don't understand. Again, this is one of those things where, well, what's going on? Um, well, it, it sounds to me that if iTunes Match, wh wherever your, your master library is, if everything goes well with iTunes Match, then replacing everything on your iOS device is issue. what you want to do. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you've got, what, 21,000 songs to go through everything and make sure that you feel comfortable well, enough. Well, actually, there is an issue because um, I, when I'm not online, I keep some songs on my device, right? I have a 64 gigabyte iPhone. I mean, I, I have room and I would like to keep some songs on my device for those times that I'm not, on, uh, that mm -hmm. I'm not online um, or on an airplane or whatever. Uh, if it rep and 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 don't you have to explicitly say re-download? Otherwise, it's it quote cash streams or what? We need a new word for whatever this thing is doing, this fake streaming. So I'm worried Photo that stream. am I going to lose some? I mean, that this is a, a legitimate concern based on this warning. Um, to be able to listen to the music offline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal I for me as well. I have a lot of storage. Just, well, yeah. I mean, that is something that on mobile devices, even streaming services like RDO, Spotify, those you can sync to mobile devices, but you have to tell it to. Right. Otherwise, it's just streaming when you're connected to an well, internet. See, that's the other story. So is. it's like you have to think about it in advance a little bit. Right. I mean, this is to compete with Spotify, right? 
Isn't that really what this it's is? It's a funny about? conversation that we're having because uh, some people really care about having those files, you know, and the files living in particular places, well, whether they're one place or multiple places. And then there are the other folks who say, well, why don't you just get a streaming service? And then you have access to all these songs. You don't have to worry about it. You just stream them whenever you want. But then, of course, the libraries aren't as robust, and that's just sort of an emerging technology, too. It's just there are two schools of thought. I think, I think this, is, this is one of the kind of, again, this is that confusion with, I don't know what is happening. Yeah, my, my, my mental disconnect is just the knowledge of what music got there because I synced it from, uh, I synced it from a, a copper connection to an iTunes library. What's there because I got to it from Music Match. It's, uh, again, not to, this is a handy prop, but one of the things I like about the way that the, the Kindle Fire did it is, is that there's an explicit separate areas where there's a, a, there's a music li library, but it's always very clear by saying you're now in a listing of all the stuff that you've got on the cloud. Now here you are in a, in a place that shows you all the stuff that is actually on your device. And if you move content from one of these areas to another con area, this another area, it's all good. It's all natural. You've basically essentially done, a, done a manual copy. It's when things happen automatically and magically that you kind of lose the mental thread of what steps got me, got this file from point A to point B. So uh, much of it is just probably going to be just a mental adjustment that your iPod and your iPhone used to work this way. Now it works in a right, new way. Right. Mac Rumors points us to uh, a forum post from Nunya uh, Benez. Uh, on Matt, the Mac Rumors forum, uh, in which uh, he or she, uh, in great detail, describes what happens, and this is, uh, I think, relevant. Nothing happens to your local music when you run Match. If you have a lower quality song that was matched, according to Nunya, you can remove it from your local library and then replace it with a 256k version. But to do that, what you do is you'll delete the, you'll manually, physically delete the song. You'll see the entry in iTunes with a little puffy cloud, and then you download it and now you've replaced it. So there is a two-step process. You do have to very explicitly delete and replace. Yeah. Um, so that's good, and it will replace at the higher bit rate. If a song is matched, it becomes available to download in a 256K AAC. If it's not matched, if you have stuff, you know, bootlegs or things that aren't in the iTunes library, it's copied in its current format and bit rate up to 320K. If you have a lossless file, and this is the problem, is a lot, of, a lot of people who are into music are very serious about it, and they're using FLAC or Apple lossless. If you have a lossless file, it's going to be turned into a 256K AAC before it's uploaded. So you'll definitely want to be very careful with your lossless files because you don't want them replaced. But again, it's not going to be automatically replaced. You'd have to explicitly delete and download to do that. Mm -hmm. um, You're not going to get lossless in the cloud, though, either way. No, no lossless, yeah. And I not, and it does not if it's formats it doesn't recognize like this you know they have some some people have PDFs of the CD liner notes and stuff like that that's that that it just ignores that and I'm I'm presuming and this seems to be the case in my collection it ignores audio books audible books unless you bought them in the iTunes store I don't know what happens there but my audio my my audible books it's just left alone everything you buy in the iTunes store is happily updated to right. the cloud that makes sense yeah because they don't even need to do anything they just say check. Right. There's a checkbox. But I, we were talking on Tech News Today yesterday. I When Apple, uh, when iTunes was still DRM, I went over to Amazon store and started downloading everything from Amazon Music. So a lot of that stuff will be matched because iTunes recognizes it, but I did not buy it within the iTunes right, store. Right. So it counts against my 25,000 songs. Right. I'm still not up that high, but... That is something to think well, about. What a surprise. This benefits people who buy iTunes music sure. more than it does anybody else. <laughs> uh, what a surprise. Um, all right. Well, I, I, you know, I, I think that the, the real issue is, is really what comes down to this whole issue anytime you sync to the cloud of what's the, what's, as you said, Andy, what's the master copy? Where does it live? Is it my copy? What happens to my copy? What happens to my metadata? And I'm really concerned, as with contacts, about duplicates, um, but in the opposite direction. You know, with contacts, sometimes with syncing, you get more than one of the same thing. I'm worried that I have three songs, a live performance, a studio performance, and a bootleg performance of the same song that metadata-wise look exactly the same. And I'm, I'm seeing in the chat room, in some cases, what will happen is it will only copy one copy. It won't recognize that these are, it'll think these are duplicates. Mm. So that's an issue as well. Mm. Um, to be careful, in other words, uh, save your libraries, back them up.
put them somewhere safe before you do this. Yeah, that, that's the huge lesson of iCloud. It's it's going to be a great service once all the all the uh, all the transition gets gets itself shook out, but. Uh, the need to actually make sure that you have a safe copy that's offline and that iCloud can't see, can't touch, and can't fix for you, I don't think it's ever been more important <laughs> than it ever has in 2011. Yeah. Hey, we're going uh, to take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about this. No, it's not the latest Mola scheme. Oh, it looks like it. <laughs> Inside this nondescript leather cover. Well, it actually is the latest Mola scheme. The latest Mola scheme. But there's scheme. something else. <laughs> <laughs> it's on fire. We're going to talk about the, uh, the Kindle fire. And this is not mine. No. Uh, this is Liz Romero's. Thank you for lending it to me, Liz, because mine, which even though I ordered it, I think exactly the same time as Liz ordered hers, it hasn't arrived yet. But it should. Today's the day for the fire. <laughs> we'll take a look at just a bit. Before we do, though, let's talk a little bit about our friends at Citrix. I was meeting with them in the Los Angeles uh, yesterday, and they are telling me all sorts of exciting things that are happening with all of their products, including the flagship Go to Meeting. You've tried GoToMeeting, right? It's, just, it's, it's online meetings uh, software. It shares the screen, makes it really easy to set up a meeting. It's cross-platform, Mac and PC. So this is great for us Mac folks. We no longer have to feel like second-class citizens when there's an online meeting. No, we're right in there. And here's the beauty part. They've just added HD video conferencing to this. In fact, we might have a little bit of an advantage because we've got these great HD cameras on our MacBooks, and it works beautifully with these. If you've never used... Uh, go to meeting. Now's a great time to try it free for 30 days. Not only will you get the online meeting capabilities, you'll get the HD video capabilities. Up to six screens at the same time. Uh, you, you know, it, the, such a difference when you're in a meeting with somebody and you see their face. You can you can read their body language. If if you're making a sales presentation, you've got your keynote presentation going, and you're looking at the client, and they suddenly fold their arms. That means something. That's valuable information that you wouldn't necessarily get on a phone call or other online meeting services. This is the best. Go to meeting.com. Visit the website. Go to meeting.com, and uh, click the uh, try it free button. That orange button there. And enter the offer code MACBREAK. You can use it free for 30 days. But i got to tell you, it's very affordable. $49 a month, including the HD faces. One of the great value uh, add things that Citrix does is uh, they don't raise the price. They just add features. And uh, this, is a, this is huge. I mean, I've seen people spend ten, twenty, thirty, a hundred thousand dollars $100,000 on video conferencing software and hardware in the conference room and only the only the CEO and this and his cohorts or her cohorts can use it and they don't use it very much now this brings it to everybody's desktop everybody with a webcam and internet can do it go to meeting.com click the try free button and uh, use our offer code macbreak to give it a try for 30 days free 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 and we thank Citrix for their support of uh, macbreak weekly this is my case though I like this case this is the Marware uh, Moleskine Moleskine Moleskine. 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 <laughs> no one knows. Um, we're all right. Or we're all take right. a vote. We're wrong. Marware, as usual, does great cases. I've used a lot of Marware cases on my iOS devices. So let me pop it out, though, so you can see what the, uh, what the, fl the fire, Kindle Fire, looks like. $199. And the reason we're talking about it on a, on a show like this, on a Mac show, is, well, if anybody's going to compete against a... Uh, oops, cancel. You're right, Andy. That was really easy to accidentally <laughs> press that on-off yeah. button. It's on the bottom right there. And, boy, yes. just holding it, you can accidentally. Especially when, when, you're, when you're sitting and you're just, like, you, you adjust a book in your hands, like, so many times over the course of 10 minutes when you're reading. And, yeah, it's I keep coming up with that, holding it down long enough to get at that. So would you like to shut down your Kindle now? No. No, I think, no. I, I think I'd actually like to keep writing, <laughs> if that's okay. I'm using it. Um, it feels fairly snappy. Now, this is my first uh, time seeing it. Uh, they've got a new Netflix uh, interface for it. Uh, I'm, the browser feels very snappy, this new uh, Silk browser. What do you think, Andy? You, you've got yours in your hot little hands. Yeah, I've had mine for about a week, uh, and it's, I like it a lot. Uh, I, don't under, I don't agree with, the, there have been some negative reviews that try to say, oh, well, it does, it's not, unlike the iPad, it doesn't do this, and it's not as good as the iPad as this. I don't think it, they tried to make an iPad. I think the fact that you turn this on and what you see is your content and not a grid of app icons, I think that pretty much demonstrates that they designed this as a content device right, right. that can also download some really cool apps and do tab, tablet-ish sort of features. Uh, it, 
has some limitations. I think they're all due to the fact that it's running Android 2.3 underneath. So the interface, you wouldn't call it snappy. I don't think it's sluggish, but if you're used to that absolutely liquid experience of yeah, using this, the iPad interface. The page right. turned little hesitations in that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, not, not, and not only that, I'm talking about like when tapping buttons, uh, it doesn't highlight immediately. Sometimes buttons don't highlight at all. It just simply goes off and does what you asked it to do without uh, confirming to you that, oh, yes, by the way, the fact that I highlighted my button means that, yes, I'm actually doing something. You don't have to keep pressing it over and over and over downloading again. Downloading the Netflix app before the show, I had to try to download it a few times. Did you? Know, you? I, I, had to, yeah. Yeah, I had to press the button a few so times. Unres kind of an unresponsive interface. Uh, this is, by the way, a, 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 an Android app, Pulse. We've, we've got it on the iOS as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, but it's, it's nice. App. We're seeing some Android apps on here right away. Did, uh, uh, did it come with yeah, this, no. or did you download this, uh, Liz? I don't know if she had. It comes with Pulse. It comes with okay. Uh, okay. Uh, IMDb. It comes with about, uh, in addition to the browser and the email client, it comes with about like three or four apps for uh, music and uh, news downloading but they spent so much time vetting their entire Amazon Amazon App Store library uh, just to check to make sure that these things actually work on the fire mostly they're just checking to see look for, to weed out apps that expect to see a hardware uh, that uh, on Android you know the, the standard like hardware buttons are on the bottom of the screen this doesn't have that doesn't have a camera doesn't have a GPS right. so if, uh, apps that are expecting that have to be sort of vetted out also hopefully the sort of apps that are so hard formatted for a phone screen that it looks terrible on a seven inch tablet uh, and they were adding stuff all the way I, I, I've it was only Sunday late afternoon that I got access to the Netflix app that's how like to the wire that they were uh, adding stuff to it. The Comixology app, which is for brings like this, the iTunes of co digital comic book stores uh, to the uh, to the fire. That was only made available to me like Sunday night. Right. Uh, so they did. They they they've really been working hard. Uh, the good news is that it does it looks like you don't have to rewrite anything for the fire. If you'd like to do that, that you can certainly optimize the experience. But you can take existing Android apps and just dump them on here, and they'll work just fine. You can even sideload apps uh, from if you, you can download and if you. Uh, push that magic button that's in most Android devices that says uh, trust download content from unsigned sources you can still just download and install apps directly from oh, a web browser that's and huge that, uh, yeah, and you're, you're taking your chances because not all of them work really well right. but if you want you don't have to necessarily so have to wait for something to hit the Amazon store it's a store. full Android device then that's interesting. It's a it's a full Android device, but again, it's optimized for content consumption. It's optimized right. for books, video, and music and photos. Plays uh, Flash. So, I was just playing a Flash. Plays yep, Flash fine. Plays just fine. Yeah, yeah. I, I just I, and I love if you've been. It really does underscore that in this day and age, it's not only the hardware and it's not even just the operating system, but it's also the ecosystem around it. And the fact that I've spent so many years buying most of my music from the Amazon MP3 store, buying books from the Amazon Kindle store means that I took this out of the package and it's within five, within five, exactly. This has never been, I'm sorry, uh, rather for the first couple of days, it wasn't even connected to any sort of a computer. Right. And yet every, it, it, the, the first time that you tap on the Steve Jobs book and immediately takes you to the page you were last on when you read it on your iPad earlier mm -hmm. that day, that's good. Mm -hmm. That That's, that's getting the experience mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Um, how about the, uh, the, uh, I'm looking here at the newsstand, the magazines, uh, that was magazines, one of the things we were very yeah. interested in, right? The magazines is, I wouldn't call it a failure, but it's, uh, hard formatted content that's been, that was designed for a sheet of magazine print doesn't really translate very well to the seven inch screen. Right. You have to, you have to poke, you have to press, you have to squeeze, you got to zoom, uh, and you got to tap a lot. And because as we said, it's not a really liquid interface. It's a big pain in the butt to try to read like a New Yorker article that's formatted across three printed columns uh, across the width of the page. It gets old pretty fast, yeah. and so uh, I'm not sure if I'll be buying a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of magazine art, magazine copies. Well, not until the, they start formatting it for this page. I mean, uh, either uh, either, for, either formatting new. for the page or either formatting for the page or coming up with other solutions. The Comixology app actually works pretty well because from day one, uh, when they were formatting stuff for phones, they have what's in addition to the full screen view. They've always had what they call a guided view so that you just keep tapping and sort of they'll, they've programmed in camera movements, so to speak, that'll zoom in on like one panel, then zoom a little bit out to see, let you see more of that, that art, and then move to the next panel in the, in the, in the, in the dialogue. Uh, and so it, you want something that helps you out like that only with magazines. Yeah. So 
Zinio, hopefully this is just the first step. Zinio is available on this as well. They, they announced immediately, yes, you can download it. So it's, it's a more, I think one thing I note is a more open device than we maybe thought. Uh, yeah. It is Wi-Fi, it's great. not it's, 3G, so you will be using your own Wi-Fi. Uh, yeah. They haven't yet released 3G versions, although I know those are coming, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, they haven't announced anything like that. I asked and they didn't, they declined to answer. Yeah, uh, but yeah, the, one, one, one of the biggest questions that I had was, are they going to be strategic about what apps they allow onto the device? And as far as they can, I can tell, they, are, they have absolutely no problems with allowing in apps that would compete with Amazon store content. So you can download a really good EPUB reader that not only supports open EPUB, but also supports Adobe DRM EPUB content. So if you've been buying stuff from the Sony reader store, no problem. You can just install it on your Kindle and read it from there. That's always been my biggest complaint about the Kindle uh, family is just that everybody, there's the Kindle fo the book format and then everybody else in the world uses the EPUB format. So now we finally have something that at least has the word Kindle printed on it that can do just as well with EPUBs as with uh, Amazon store content. Right. This is uh, Details Magazine, one of a number of magazines that offer uh, free uh, first uh, editions for a look. Uh, and I see exactly what you're saying. I mean, really, this is like a PDF of the magazine. I have to zoom yeah. in, double tap. I mean, this could be a web page. How's the Silk browser? Because they made a lot of hay about how they were going to have this fancy new browser on. Yeah, there. That, that, that was frustrating because I, man alive, I tested it out with the cloud-based acceleration turned on, the cloud-based acceleration turned off. <laughs> the, the whole point of the Silk browser is that it'll offload a lot of the work of downloading all the elements on the web page to cloud, Amazon cloud services. So that instead of this puny little mobile device having to download 20 elements, it's the servers that download all those 20 elements, then it pushes it all the, all the way down to your, your Wi-Fi connection to the device. Uh, so I, I tried it with acceleration on, with it off. I tried I uh, compared it to iOS, I compared it to desktops. I just couldn't find any consistency with the speed of the app. There's just It just really ran for me as fast as any other browser did. So I don't know whether that's because they haven't really gotten it dialed in yet. Maybe part of it is because one of the optimizations that it does is uh, to kind of crowdsource information from every Kindle Fire Silk browser user right. to try to anticipate what you're going to be doing next. Right. Like if you're on the top page, if you're on the top page of the SunTimes site, it's very, very likely that the very next thing you're going to tap is the is the link for Roger Ebert's blog. Right. So it'll preload that in the background so that if you do tap that link, boom, it's it's liquid in this instant. Uh, so maybe there's part of that there. But as far as it, it really, from what they were telling, talking about and all the documentation they're putting up about how it works, it really should have been much faster than it actually was. But you, you do get one you do get one benefit built in because all the traffic in the accelerated mode between uh, the Silk browser on this device and on the cloud services, it's encrypted. So it's sort of like you're getting secure Wi-Fi and uh, a secure connection, encrypted connection, uh, even if you're on an open public Wi-Fi. It's not as secure as VPN, but in terms of people in the coffee shop being able to sniff your traffic, that should make it almost impossible for the casual person to do that. I have to say it feel you know, I think, uh, well, first of all, seven inches, it's kind of heavy and clunky, very much like a BlackBerry playbook. Um, people who compare it to the iPad, I mean, it, it's going to... It's not going to compare well to the iPad. It's not a general purpose device by any means. It's a Kindle. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't feel like an iPad at all. No. I mean, my, I right. had the first reaction that you had. Wow, it's heavier than I thought it would be yeah. when I first picked it up. Yeah. But yeah. after yeah, just, the, just navigating for, around for, people, for a few this minutes. Is the, this is the, the playbook. You got, it looks the same. Yeah, there are people who are like who after I posted my review Sunday night said, "Oh no, all they did was like rebrand the playbook." No, they didn't. It's an it's a totally different device. Yeah. I don't know if they OEM. If I don't know if they basically have the same company build it, but it's really they're totally different devices. So if people are paying two hundred bucks for this, I mean, obviously they know that there's three hundred dollar difference between this and an iPad. Are yeah. they getting what they expect, and are they going to buy it in droves? The story is that Amazon's making five million of them. To sell yeah. for Christmas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the question is going to be if you if on December twenty first you can't buy one in time for Christmas, that's all they have to say about the success of the device, uh, right. because they've they've never talked about sales figures on previous Kindles before. But a sellout is a sellout. I mean, I, I think I don't understand people who are comparing it to the iPad. I don't think I think that's that not each. It. Exactly. Well, not only that, but each of these devices can't compare favorably to each other. Because if I decide that I don't like the iPad and I want to say that this is a better device, all I have to say is 
$200 and you can stick it in your pocket. Right. And for that, a lot of people who ha might have looked at the iPad but decided, no, this isn't for me, are going to say, no, this is exactly the device I'm looking for. I like to have a, a word processor for it so I can download. If, if someone wants to email me a document as a text attachment, I can do an edit, then edit and then email it back. But I don't need a real post PC computing device. I really just want a tablet computer for consuming media. So I think that, I think they complement each other very, very nicely in the marketplace. I don't think they really compete with each well, other. Well, think about all the Kindle faithfuls already. People who love their Kindles, they read their books exclusively, or at least most of the time on their Kindles. This is something that you still have a great reading consumption device, but it does a lot more. I don't know. I think there are a lot of Kindle people, and I might include myself, who one of the reasons we like the Kindle is it's very light, very thin, yeah, and it's e -ink. E ink. And this yeah. is not that. Um, well, and but they know. remember that they still have. I've gotten in the other room, but they still have a, a brand new line of Kindles. Right, both which I bought. Absolute, I love. Exactly. They're cheap for seventy nine bucks, or a touch version for only a little bit more than that. So, yeah, yeah. The basic Kindle to me uh, is exactly what I want. And you know, I already bought this, but uh, now that I played with it, I, I I'm thinking, eh, I don't know if I would use it. Very it's much. not something that I would need because I you have a I iPad. have an iPad. Yeah. I, I think uh, especially for the gift season, the price is really attractive. Uh, somebody in chat mentioned, you know, if, if if it's something that you don't want a little kid to break, this seems like it right. makes more sense. Right. Um, but then again, you know, and, and I know that Amazon's app store will only get better, but there's really no comparing to what iOS can offer you at this point. It I think also what is what you want to do. Yeah. One, one thing with the, with the fire and the iPad, I think with the iPad, people don't, in some cases, they don't really know why they need the iPad because it's such a mm -hmm. wide ranging device. You yeah. know, you can read books and you can listen to music, you can watch movies, but there's so much more because of the app you know, the apps that are available. So people, I think, sort of buy it because they've heard it's a great device and they, they think it might fit in with their lifestyle and they might be able to use it for this and that. And then when they do find it, when they do get it, you know, it does fit in because it's very malleable. You can, you can actually mold it to do whatever you want it to do. Whereas with the Fire, it, it's very, it, its niche is, is defined. It is to consume media. It's your book reader. It's your movie watcher. And I think that's going to make the, the, the decision point for a lot of people to say, yeah, actually, I could... You know, I could see myself using a Fire, whereas in uh, before they might say, well, the iPad is a bit expensive and I don't really know what I'm going to use it for, so I'll probably go with the Fire. Now, whether or not that will cannibalize, I doubt it will actually cannibalize iPad sales, but it, it just seems a great alternative for people who don't really quite glom onto the fact, you know, what can you actually do with an iPad? Absolutely. I think the biggest advantage that it has is, this, is the simple word Kindle. I mean, Amazon did something that only Apple, I think, has done pre previously, where there was a broad category of products called digital music players. But as soon as the iPod came out, every digital music player became called the iPod. Uh, similarly, people don't think of an electronic book reader. They think, of, they think of a Kindle. And maybe they have a Kindle that's made by Kobo. Maybe they have a Kindle made by Sony, but they think Kindle. So the person that they know who has an ebook reader probably already has a Kindle and that will sort of introduce them to say, well, why would I buy any other book reader but the ones that I see everybody else trying to use? It's a nice word with friends, uh... Uh, well, <laughs> hey, you know what? Don't knock it right because uh, there's Why certain. Not? I mean, there's a few games that. Uh, I mean, look, uh, you know, if you could play like the three games that people really care about, mm -hmm. uh, or a person really cares about, then that might be a good choice. You know, I, my mom. Well, that's a, that's. I think it was a, uh, It was in a recent Wired article where Jeff Bezos was quoted as saying that it was he saw the fire as a media service not even a device yep. right. a media service where you you know you can read you can you can watch videos you can play some games you can buy from amazon everything as far as the amazon ecosystem is with you and it's mobile right, right. but it's a service more than it's actually a it's thing it's a portal yes it's a, por yeah. a portal to the amazon yeah, you, you, you didn't even, you didn't even hear amazon just talking about themselves as a cloud services company until they introduced the Kindle Fire. Right. So that's a pretty clear statement, isn't it? Yeah. All right, enough about the Kindle. But I, I, I mean, uh, I thought it, given that it's being positioned by some as an iPad killer, I thought it's appropriate to talk about it. I think this will appear mm -hmm. in a lot of stockings at 200 bucks. But if you have It'll an fit in the stocking. And it will fit. And if, <laughs> but if you have an iPad, there is absolutely no reason to get this, right? I, I don't need it. I would it. agree. No. Why would you get it? I don't yeah. need it. Yeah, so... I mean, the only reason I would want it is if for some reason there was a, I couldn't travel with this, and right. that's just not the case. Right, right. All right, there we go. Uh, we're going to take another break, uh, come back with more. 
Uh, notice it plays Flash. This, this may, be, yeah. may, may be one of the few devices that still plays Flash. Adobe blames Apple. At least one manager at Adobe blames Apple for the death of Flash. We'll talk about that. Uh, lingering battery complaints with iOS 5. I'd be curious what your results are. And I don't know about you, but I've been having other issues with iOS 5 that I, 501 that I didn't have. Uh, I think 501 may have broken some things. Uh, more to come in just a bit as we continue with Mac Break Weekly. Andy Anatko is here from the Chicago Sun Times. Sarah Lane from TNT, the Social Hour iPad today. Am I missing anything? Mm, no. And, uh, and, a, <laughs> and, and I am sure I'll get Facebook. on another show eventually. Sarah Lane of Facebook fame, <laughs> and from Screencasts Online, Mr. Donnie McAllister. Um, so we're going to uh, take a break uh, right now and talk a little bit about the folks at Gazelle. You know, I, th I have to say, one of the pain points of moving to a new device like the Fire is having an old device and thinking about, oh, you know, did I get my money's worth and what am I going to do with the old device? And that's where Gazelle.com is so fantastic. Visit it right now, G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. I think you can see my screen now. Can you? I'm I'm wondering if it's a system setting for you because I see a blue screen. This is what I see. Well, that's <laughs> not me. <laughs> but um, um, I'm wonder. I mean, mm -hmm. I could see that it's connected. Yeah, I, I, I connected it up. That's very strange. And I have uh, played well, around with various. I don't various... know what to say. I'm just befuddled. Sorry, Leo. I'm befuddled. Well, you show it then. Gazelle.com. I, I know you have it on your <laughs> yes. on your browser. G a z e l l e dot com. When you go there, you could pick an object, uh, like, oh, I don't know. Let's say you want to sell your iPad. Maybe you've decided that the iPad is just not the future for you. You want a Kindle Fire. Uh, Which iPad? Oh, any uh, pick one. You see that? First, you just type IPAD, and it sees all the different models of iPad. You pick the one you want to sell, uh, and then you'd give it some information about the condition, all the stuff. Yes, it's completely. It completely func. No, it's. N n yeah, that's fine. Noticeable, and then you could say, well, what does it look like? Things like that. Now, one of the things people worry about is, well, what happens if I still have data on it? Don't worry. They're data experts as they uh, evaluate the product. Look at that. Two hundred eighteen bucks. That'll buy you right there, a Kindle Fire. Boom. Booyah. Bow. Zam. And you get 18 bucks to spare for shipping or, you know, a few lattes. I, 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 I think this is, I mean, it's pretty much, how are you going to get uh, that amount of money anywhere else? I agree. Gazelle. Well, you know, and, and people say that sometimes. They say, well, I'll, I could just go on uh, eBay and sell it. And you may make more money, but boy, it's not, not it's just so easy because what There's you do hassle. now is, yeah, so what, you know, that's the trade off. You want to make 20 bucks more, but you do all the work, go right ahead, be my guest. <laughs> this, all you do here is you put it in a box, they pay the shipping. They get, they get a shipping label. You could put a lot of things. In fact, I would recommend going through your closet and just everything old that you can find that you don't want anymore, even if it has no value, because re re Gazelle recycles it. Bless you. Recycles it. You know, whenever I get excited about something, I sneeze. That's a sign that I'm really Well, I think I'm about. done with my tea. <laughs> I covered. <laughs> I sneezed into my... I did eh. Eh, Tis the did I hit it? Season. You think I hit it? I don't know. I'm just not gonna. It. Let's not. I'm done. You want some water? No. Nope. <laughs> that was even closer. <laughs> so here, have my hanky. So uh, <laughs> now, see, this would have no value on Gazelle. Uh, so that's what would happen is they would recycle it, and they do it by the way, no landfill. They take this is the best electronics recycling out there. Um, they don't send it overseas. They don't, uh, you know, put uh, it in the landfill. They take it apart, get the component stuff out of it, and uh, and you can be sure that you're getting the best electronics recycling if it has no value. Get the value for your objects, uh, your former objects of desire. Uh, recycle appropriately if it's unusable. Gazelle is fantastic. And don't forget, you can even create a, a charity page for your school or your organization and have a gadget drive. Send people to the special page and raise money that way. It's really fantastic. Gadgets in 20 product categories, 200,000 unique items, iPhones going from, say, 122 to 163 bucks, the uh, iPod Touch 4G, 107 bucks. You want to get rid of your Android phone and go iPhone, HTC Sensation 4G, $195. The Droid Bionic, 290 bucks. I mean, I could just go on and on. Gazelle.com. Don't sell it. Gazelle it. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E dot -E -E com. Nice people, too. I really like Gazelle. Uh, you know, I think we talked about this last week, the, the fact that, of course, um, uh, from the grave, Steve Jobs can declare victory because Adobe declared Flash is dead. Well, I think they declared it dead last Wednesday. Last week, so we didn't get a so, chance to talk yeah. about it. Yeah. 
Um, an Adobe product manager pointed to the fact that Apple had refused to support Flash on iOS as a major reason. Mike Chambers, principal product manager for developer relations for the Flash platform, posted a, a blog post. Yeah, you're right. It was Wednesday. Apple said, or Adobe said it'll continue to support existing implementations. So the Flash 11 that you have on your Android device will continue to work, but is going to cease development on mobile in order to redirect resources to better focus on HTML5. But I got to say, if you're, I mean, just think it, think it through, think the chess game through, you kill it on mobile, more and more people surf with mobile. Mm -hmm. If I have Flash on my website, even if it's still available on the desktop, am I going to use it? Hell no. It's dead all over. It has to be dead because we're mm -hmm. just going to consume more on our mobile devices. Right. Uh, restaurant menus, those <laughs> wonderful, beautiful flash restaurant menus, we all know them and hate them. Yeah. Uh, all the time, especially when I'm going to a new city and I'm trying to figure out where all the places it. that I'm going to go. I'm looking at everything on my iPad and it's like I just bounce right on out of there. There are so many websites that are just absolutely useless to me. And iOS did help kill Flash. I mean, this yeah. Adobe manager is not telling us anything that we don't already know. Yep. Uh, of course. That's the end. By the way, does, is, is this, did I press a button or does the uh, Kindle Fire go into trailer mode for a screensaver? Because I'm getting a Harry Potter trailer now. Is that what, what? it does, Andy? No, it doesn't. That you would must, be a must. very <laughs> weird feature. No, it would be a great feature. <laughs> No, it wouldn't. What if you're sleeping? Oh yeah, you're right. Never mind. I can tell you. I can tell you that I've never <laughs> had. I've like never made that happen. I must have just. I didn't touch anything. Oh. It's also not oh, an yeah. upcoming movie, so. That's true. So why would it even do yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Chambers. I feel bad for Mike. He spent the past twelve or thirteen years working with the technology as part of the Flash community. According to him, the past couple of days have been some of the most difficult of his career. There will be, I'm sure, many jobs lost in, at Adobe. Um, he says, considering how politically charged the issue has been, the decision to stop development of the Flash player for mobile web browsers was not an easy decision. However, at the end of the day, there were a number of items that made it clear that putting resources toward its continued development would not be the best use of resources at Adobe. The first reason he cited is the fact that Flash would never achieve the same ubiquity on mobile devices it has on the desktop. Yeah, because half of all mobile devices are iOS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This one should be pretty apparent, but given the fragmentation of the mobile market, he says, and the fact that one of the leading mobile platforms, Apple's iOS, was not going to allow the Flash player in the browser, the Flash player was not on track to reach anywhere near the ubiquity of the Flash player on desktops. There's an interesting yeah. blog post by somebody who said, you know, Adobe's big mistake was doing this Flash Lite player with uh, uh, NTT Docomo in Japan. They put it on their feature phones, and it fragmented the Flash market right out of the gate on mobile. And that really Adobe killed Flash, not Apple. Adobe was the one that blew it. Well, it was it, they were they were, they were going to need a lot of things in the world to go their way in order to continue with Flash, uh, because it, it really it really is the non-involvement of Apple and the fact that Flash no Flash would just by definition unless Apple backed down have absolutely no relevance for mobile computing. Yep. That really just did it in. But I'm still uh, someone someone uh, on Twitter. Uh, threw back one of my comments back at me from earlier in the year because uh, uh, when the BlackBerry Playbook and another Android tablet came out, uh, I tested out Flash on both devices and said, well, I, we all know what, what Steve Jobs has said, that Flash would never work on mobile. It'll kill the battery. It won't work properly. It'll be a terrible experience. And I can tell you that, well, I... I've been watching two or three hours worth of Conan O'Brien show off a of TBS's site, which I can't do on my iPad. Right. Uh, it didn't kill the battery, didn't cause it to overheat. Uh, it worked just, it, there was about first 30 seconds were terrible, but after it buffered, it worked just fine. So I'm a little bit conflicted. I mean, obviously, I, I agree with the point that Adobe would never have stopped doing mobile flash had Apple not put its foot down. But in the meantime, you, you wind up with a device that you paid $500 for that can't access a huge amount of really desirable content only because the company that took your $500 decided that they wanted to make a political gesture. Uh, so hopefully, and, and I don't think that they can get all of the credit for the transition to HTML5 because that was already really well underway. Um, I, I was talking to uh, last year a, a lot of people who were uh, 
who uh, do internet video, not just, you know, for like corporate sites, but also for like main networks, like actual, like big uh, popular TV shows. And they said that, well, their infrastructure was accommodating both Flash and HTML, HTML, HTML5 all along. So that was basically something they've never been thinking of. So I'm glad, I mean, I'm glad it's dead because uh, if nothing else, it'll convince so many of these, like, like you said, like these, these restaurant websites to say, what if you don't have the first 30 seconds of your, of your experience, not be Please. a hand comes in and lights a candle and the smoke <laughs> turns into the chef's head. Like, how about you tell it's seven 30. What if you tell me if you're open until 10 or not? You know, so it's so true. That is the, that is a, a good point though, that, I mean, this isn't just Apple saying we don't want anything to do with flash. I mean, look at Google. Google is one of the biggest HTML5 champions out there. But is HTML5 ready to take over? I mean, that's the other question. It's te technically it's ready, but the other factor is that there aren't as many people who are staffed up and ready to code to do. They're, they're not the same library of people, not the same army of people who are as experienced with HTML5 as they are experienced in developing for Flash. But we don't have so a I video codec standard for HTML5 yet. I mean, there's things missing. Well, you don't, you don't necessarily need one as long as you just simply have the wrapper defined and then put right. in whatever you want to define. Also, the other big win is that I, I think that Apple gets... Um, I, I would not give them as much credit for killing Flash as I would for the simple dis idea to say we're going to develop uh, a browser engine called WebKit that we're going to give away to everybody so that every single device out there and most desktops out there can all be a hugely studly HTML5 rendering engine. Uh, and the fact that no matter what sort of device that you want to uh, that you want to d uh, navigate the web on, including the Kindle Fire, it will be the most HTML5 happy uh, experience ever. So, if any uh, more than simply de more than simply declining to support Flash, it was just the simple the, the fact that everybody who wants to put a web browser on any sort of device will have the ability to do great video without supporting Flash uh, directly. That I think uh, was the blow that really that really struck home. And I think we have to say that Flash is dead on the desktop, even though Chrome builds in Flash and Adobe's saying, oh, no, we're going to keep developing for the desktop. I guess maybe Adobe Air or something. But I, I, just, I just don't see it on the desktop. If, if it's, well, so there, it's not going to be on web pages anymore, right? So, Well, the, the, we also have, you also have to deal with, uh, 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 like, Netflix uses Silverlight. Which is not in the same sort of... Which, by the, the way, Microsoft, league. according to Mary Jo Foley, who's a, a, one of the top Microsoft observers and the host of uh, Windows Weekly, Microsoft's planning to kill Silverlight. Mm. And, and so yeah. it may be that these... And I don't... And you know what? I think that's a good thing. These proprietary wrappers owned by Adobe or Microsoft should go away. The web should not be using proprietary technologies like that. Um, yeah, I'd love to see to WebM be... replace uh, uh, Flash. I don't know if it will. That's the the uh, Google supposedly open sourced codec for video. Jo uh, go ahead. Yeah, this, yeah, this blog post seems a bit weird though in the fact that they do actually mention Apple. Uh, I mean, they never mentioned the. I know. You know I know. Uh, and in some respects, it's sort of, <laughs> you know, I was going to buy a boat this year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, there are other things in the blog post that say, you know, it's difficult to develop for. It didn't perform as well as we thought it would. Right. Uh, the amount of resource required for every new device that comes out that needs to support Flash, the amount of work they need to do for, you know, for tweaking and testing, etc. So to actually include Apple in the equation as well does seem to me a little bit of a well, actually, you know. It's Apple's fault, really, and, and you know we can't really do it without them. But um, you well, know, that's they've... true, though. Is it not true? Um, yeah, I think the interesting thing now, though, is is how are all these other non iOS devices going to differentiate themselves? Because it's been such a big selling point. You know, it's oh, the oh, selling point. Yeah. yeah. What do you say now? Yeah. Android. Will you rerun Flash? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Uh, so also uh, all your real player content, you've got the <laughs> best optimized environment ever. Well, and, and that you know, I'm glad you mentioned real player because really, uh, uh, while people think, oh, Flash has always been here and it's going to be the future, and remember, real. I mean, everything. If you go look at old websites, .dot ra was everywhere. That was the format for years, and you might have said the same thing about .dot ra, and that went away too. So these, this is normal. This is just kind of how things evolve, and. Uh, I just I, I'm a strong believer in open. I hate to see proprietary standards uh, become the standard because then one company controls it, uh, and one company, as we could see, can kill it, and uh, that's not what you want on the web. I don't think. Uh, yeah. Will there be a new MacBook Air in a couple of months? That uh, rather a MacBook Pro that looks just like a MacBook Air, and would you run out to get it? Uh, Nine to five Mac, quoting Digitimes, saying Apple's ordering components for a 15-inch. 
MacBook Pro that would essentially be thin, no uh, optical drive, a high-powered MacBook Air. I'd buy it. Mm-hmm. Of course, I buy everything. So I'm, I'm <laughs> the wrong guy. To it's, inter- it's interesting to think what would they would whether they would label it as a MacBook Pro or simply as a 15-inch Air. I'm not sure if the world is ready yet to say that it's called a Pro, but you don't get an optical drive and you're stuck with 256 gigs of storage, which you can't expand. Right. Uh, Part of this requires Ivy Bridge, which is Intel's uh, 22 nanometer um, processor, i7 processor that is... Quad-core. Not only quad-core, but much more Mm power-efficient. Uh, and that's key because, of course, that's one of the things you lose when you get a thin design is, is battery. Uh, so in order to make that work, I think um, to get a 15-inch MacBook or a 17-inch MacBook Air, uh, Ivy Bridge will have to happen. That's probably next spring. Um, I think yeah, I mean, the Pro, the Pro thing, it's, it's down to performance, isn't it, and expandability. I mean, uh, you know, with the Ivy Bridge and, you know, I mean, these MacBook Airs... And Thunderbolt. Got, All you need and, is and one th- port, right? Yeah, well, that's right. And, and by that time, hopefully, fingers crossed, I know we've been waiting long enough for all these peripherals to magically appear, but, you know, within, I would think, four to five months, we probably will start seeing all these additional peripherals that are Thunderbolt enabled that will, would enable a pro to use a MacBook Air or, or the new MacBook Pro, you know, in, in the professional environment. And we know that, what, what was it, 23, 24% of all uh, Mac sales are now MacBook Airs. It is hugely successful. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so why not? I mean, it's there. At some point, you're going to have to redo the MacBook Pros. Why not go in that direction with with all of them? And then for people who need optical, what it's really saying is, optical's gone, and I think that's not an unreasonable bet, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, some people still make the case. I like having an optical drive, but you can see with all the people who have bought the Airs that you get used to not having you do. one. You do. Mm. Yeah, but th- there's the use case for uh, so many of these machines is not your mobile travel word uh, road warrior machine but this is the only mac i have this is my only computer and it rarely leaves my de- my actual physical desktop so that two times those two times a year when you actually want to rip a dvd or rip a cd that actually becomes an important case yeah but if you're so. apple that just sells more mac uh, imax or or, ex- or or 100 dollar external drives yeah yeah or yeah, something super apps, great yeah yeah Maybe a dock. I mean, I sat the, uh, when I went over to Blog World in LA, I, I took my 11 inch MacBook Air. Um, fair enough, it's the top of the range one. It's got the 256 gig um, hard disk in, you know, the SSD drive. And I actually put Final Cut Pro on, and I put a ton of stuff I wanted to edit. And I was sitting on the plane quite happily editing away my HD videos. Isn't that awesome. I did- didn't yeah. render them when I, on, until I came back, obviously, but, you know, it, it, was, it was perfect. It worked a treat. No, no problems whatsoever. Yeah, I'm a fan, and I, I think that's a great form factor, and people obviously love it. In fact, they, they love it so much that uh, Windows uh, hard, hardware manufacturers are trying to do these Ultrabooks that are essentially clones of the MacBook Air. They're trying to get in on this, too. Yeah, it's really, really funny. I had the Asus uh, first. Uh, Did you have the, Zen? the, the, the one th- yeah, the one that they released a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And it's like, I have pictures of them side by side, and it is <laughs> like they pulled molds directly <laughs> off of those these things. It's the weird... It, 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 I mean, on top of I realize that some, uh, some of the placement of ports is dictated by the shape of the thing. When you've got this razor-thin right. leading edge, mm-hmm. the only place right. to put it is near the hinge. But when you say, okay, so I put the power connector here on yeah. the air, and I put it yeah. at the same place on the Asus, and here's where the monitor connector goes, and here's where the monitor connector goes. But it, it's... It's a, it's a tougher sell, though, on, on the PC side because they're competing. When, when Apple s- decides to sell us an 11-inch MacBook Air for $999, we're excited because that's the cheapest MacBook you can possibly buy, and it's so slim and it's so cool. However, on the PC side, they're competing against absolutely kick-butt compact uh, notebooks that cost $400 less than what they're selling an Ultrabook for. And it doesn't have the... It, it doesn't have all the Intel specs for Ultrabooks, but it still has an eight-hour battery in it. It still has, uh, like, the three USB ports instead of just uh, just one and a half. Uh, so it's it's going to be interesting to see if the if the Windows world decides that it, too, wants to have those really nice ultralight machines. I hope, though, that Apple does continue to at least do a Mac Pro, and apparently there are some rumors again that they're considering uh, dumping the Mac Pro. you got to have some Pro stuff, even if you don't have a Pro laptop. Well, real, but, but 
what for? I mean, the, for the, the only two, well, just for, for like, yeah, for like multiple. Well, I'll, I'll tell you right now, we're, we're buying another edit station. I don't right. see us really buying an iMac for that. I think we need a pro. We've got yeah, to put well, a black well, magic card in it for yeah, capture. The, We've got to put a sand card in it. Mm -hmm. The only, the only two things that people keep telling me about that they absolutely need uh, for that kind of high-end stuff is they need a rack for uh, internal drives so they can have more than just just a couple, and they need slots for these esoteric right. interfaces, the esoteric right. accelerators. Apple's response to that is that people are going to hear, hey, didn't, didn't you go to the NAP convention a few months ago? Well, that, that, that really great audio processing car is now going to be a Thunderbolt box. And you say, that's really great. When's that shipping? And they say... Hey, did you <laughs> see the ultra matte black display? The how black that display is on the IMAX? Said, yeah, I asked the question about the. Hey, look a duck. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. Okay, let me think about this. So, because so the two things we need are a black magic uh, video card, and we need a SAN access. So we need a fiber channel card. If I guess if we could do that through Thunderbolt, mm -hmm. it'd be okay. Um. I don't know. And putting, uh, yeah, I guess. It kind of, I mean, it, it kind of feels. It, it kind of feels like if Apple were to stop making Mac Pros, they're kind of declining the opportunity to make free money. Right. Because I, 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 I'm I can buy it. I can. Yeah, I can understand how they would never decide to reinvent the Mac Pro, where this simple cheese grater tower design is pretty much the only design they're ever going to do. But if they simply say we're just going to keep doing processor upgrades at least for the next three or four years until. Everybody who had and anybody who will ask ask us the question, how can I do this on an iMac that I uh, this thing that I want to do the Mac Pro? And it's going to take a few years for that to happen. Uh, I don't think we're going to see a, a really cool colossal redesign, but I, I think we're still a while's off from Apple never doing another Mac Pro. Well, I think they're happy. Yeah. Apple killed the X Serve. Uh, you know, I think mm -hmm. they're I think they're they are very capable of refocusing their business and saying yeah. we're a consumer electronics company. If you're a pro, go elsewhere. We don't care about you. It's too small a market. Uh, and well, then the pros the buy issue, PCs, right? Yeah, the issue with the Mac Pro, though, the current Mac Pro, is that, you know, it, it's overly engineered. Uh, I mean, I've got oh, two yeah. of these oh, yeah. pieces, you know, it's and it's, it's just a, a solid piece of metal. But the reason it mm -hmm. is this design is because you've got the four dri internal drive bays. Right. You've got uh, the option to upgrade to, you know, gigabytes and gigabytes of RAM. You've got the option to have uh, four additional card slots in. So, you know, the ventilation has to be there. The fans have to be there. It has, everything has to be built so that it can support all this expansion. Um, you know, the power supply has to be uh, configured so that it could take, you know, a fully loaded Mac Pro. And, you know, it's all weight, it's all expense. Once you start taking away the requirement to have these internal drives, once you have a, a five-drive um, Thunderbolt array external to your machine, once you have um, a Blackmagic card that's connectable by a Thunderbolt that you can do capture from external to your machine, you can literally bring the machine down to the size of a Mac Mini or, you know, a 1U rack, you know, reinvent the Xserve, but based on Thunderbolt technology. Mm. Yeah, I guess you can. And, uh, and, and I guess the, really the only thing we're saying, the only question is, does Apple care at all about this market? Because mm -hmm. they certainly can support it somehow. Uh, or is it that literally Apple doesn't care about the market because it's too small and, uh, and, you know, they don't, you know, the final cut is now, mm. uh, is now a consumer <laughs> product. And uh, and we're just uh, dinosaurs. It seems like uh, what Andy was saying, if they're going to continue to sell Mac Pros, why not keep offering them? Maybe um, figure out how many you can uh, cut out of the manufacturing line right. and make sure that you don't have a surplus. Right. But otherwise, yeah, for the next five years, I don't I don't just see them cutting it them. out. Yeah. You could also you could also like manipulate I think these high end users into buying iMacs and Mac. MacBook Pros as an act of fake rebellion, that if Apple simply continues to drag its feet on delivering the best processors into the Mac Pro line, these people can say, oh yeah, well Apple, I'm going to tell, I'm going to, I've had it with waiting for the new Mac Pro, I'll teach you a lesson, I'm going to buy myself a top of the line iMac. <laughs> <laughs> you so just there. The Mac Pro customer. By the way, I have, have, okay, I have been playing uh, Skyrim uh, Elder Scrolls V, which is a Windows game on my uh, high-end iMac and it plays beautifully running Windows and Boot Camp. It's just gorgeous, so there you go. Uh, maybe that's the solution, just buy, a, buy an iMac. We're going to do a couple of quick stories and then get to our picks. We uh, want to mention, though, uh, according to um, uh, who, uh, the adoption rate of OS X Lion has seen a drastic slowdown. Um, it's a, this is a study, and I don't know how accurate from Chitaka. Uh, that only 16% of all Macs are running Lion. 
and that sales have slowed to a crawl. Snow Leopard is on 56% of all Max. Um, is there a little bit of a bounce back, a, a blowback against Lion? Are people deciding that they don't like the iOSification? Are they a little bit worried about losing things like Quicken? Um, is Lion perhaps not doing as well as it should? What do you what do you what do you think, Don? Uh, it's difficult to say because I'm, I'm not. I can't see it being that low, to be honest. And it does seem more. It seems I, I awfully know. low. Sixteen yeah. percent. Yeah, I mean, the Omni Group uh, tend to do some metrics on adoption because they can tell, you know, from the people who use their software, they, they do sort of some metrics. And they actually, although they haven't refreshed it recently, uh, they did show quite a steep curve for the adoption in, in the early couple of weeks for Lion. Now, whether or not that's tailed off or not, we don't know. Well, that's but, what this study says, is that it was very strong yeah. initially, but the sales have slowed to a crawl. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I know some people are upset about some of the changes in Lion, but, um, I, you know, I, I think people, from, from Screencast Online point of view, I'm seeing lots of people who are adopting Lion. They want Lion, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I, I sort of need to keep up with that. But I do get people saying, no, we're still on Snow Leopard, etc. But uh, I'm not really sure what the, the, the issue is, if there is an issue there to begin with. I think one of the problems is that you can't, a lot of users can't just upgrade to Lion. They have to first upgrade, upgrade to Snow Leopard. Right. So that's, a, mm -hmm. that's another outlay of cash uh, and another uh, intermediate step. It's really surprising how many people are still using 10.5 and even 10.4. Apple may have, a, may be the Microsoft effect. Might be like, uh, their, it might be their Vista. It took me forever to upgrade to Lion, and it wasn't because I wasn't interested. It was sort of on my to-do list. But, but Snow there was Leopard, nothing pushing you. Snow in that Leopard way. worked fine. Right. A couple of my yeah. friends said, "Oh, you're, it's going to be so weird. Could you scroll you do in the opposite direction yeah. as if you were on an you know, iOS it device?" It may just be that. And I thought, "Uh, I'm not really in the mood to do that differently today." Right. And so it took me forever to just launch the Mac App Store <laughs> and download Lion. Once I did, it was seamless, and I'm totally used to it now. Yeah. It took me about two days I, to I, get I used to it. But I, I have felt to, no need. Yeah, the, the the good thing though is the versions. I mean, there are some features in Lion which I find now invaluable. Um, you know, the fact that we've got the versioning, um, which is part of the operating system, providing the app has been lionized. Um, the fact that you can actually go back and see past versions of documents that just works seamlessly. I know some people are a little bit uh, upset about the removal of file save as, but again, there are ways around that. You know, it's just a new way of working. Um, but the benefits that it gives you, I, I think, do pay back. Uh, can I do some gratuitous self-promotion? Please. <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny thing is, no, I actually, um, I, obviously with Screencast Online, I did a ton of Lion content because I sort of wanted to, I always try to guide my sort of members through the, the installation process and then sort of getting the best out of Lion. Because I think Apple haven't done a very good job about demonstrating what is actually in Lion and the benefits that it brings. So um, I've actually just, uh, not just about three weeks ago, I, I, I launched a, Mac, a Mac App Store app all about Lion. Oh, that's so, neat. Uh, as well as my sort of weekly show now, I've, I've launched into app development with a friend of mine, a guy called Simon Wolf. And uh, we've got this uh, application now on the Mac App Store, which is about five episodes that takes you through all the features in Lion and, and how to get the most out of it. But th the unique thing is it's, it's actually got subtitles on as well. So it's got um, English subtitles, French, uh, Spanish, Chinese and Brazilian Portuguese as well. So uh, if people want, well, mind you, if people want, I was going to say, if people want to check out what Lion's all about, they can actually go and download the app. But the app is just for Lion only, which <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't funny. meant as a sales thing. It was meant really, you know, if people have upgraded to Lion. Uh, if you have, and, and, and I mean, I can, I think I can arrange a non-Lion version some way, but uh, the current version on the Mac App Store is, is a Lion only version. But it, if you have upgraded to Lion, it, it sort of takes you through. It's about two and a half hours long takes you through, you know, all the features and explains all the benefits to it. Interesting. Lion only. Mm -hmm. <laughs> SCO Tutor for Lion. I best mention the name, hadn't I? Oh, yeah, because I, I was searching for all about Lion. I didn't find it. SCO Tutor? SCO Tutor for Lion. It's had about, um, about 95 star reviews in the past three weeks. Very which, nicely uh, is nice. great. SCO, of S course, is Screencasts Online. Screencasts Online Tutor yeah. for Lion. Yeah. All one word in SCO Tutor. Oh, cool. All right. I see it right here. Mm-hmm. Five dollars ninety nine cents. Thank you uh, for doing that. That's great. No problem. Yeah. All right. Uh, five oh one. Real quickly, and I got we got we got to move along here. Uh, you haven't upgraded your iPad to five oh one yet. I have not. And I upgraded everything, and I'm starting to think maybe I shouldn't have. So what's wrong? Well, my iPhone. I have to reboot it a lot. Andy, have you had any issues with five oh one? 
Uh, not at all. Uh, my phone works fine. Uh, I wasn't suffering any major battery issues, but now I'm suffering even less fewer. So you major did see an improvement issues. in battery for it. For it, I, I saw. I saw a bit of improvement. I wasn't having the sort of crippling issues. Uh, it's a big. Uh, my my actual personal iPad is the iPad One, so that was a definite must-have upgrade because right. that's the only way you can get those four-fingered swipes to go in and out of uh, to swap between apps. Uh, for some reason, I don't know why they didn't put it into 5.0, but now it's available to me in 5.0. So I've had nothing but good news with it. All right. Maybe it's just yeah. me. No, it's me as well. Oh, I, you too? I, I was, yeah, well, I was one of the people who suffered from the battery issues from when the, ah. I, uh, the iPhone 4S came out. Okay. Uh, it was terrible. It was, it was awful. Um, it, it, just, it just wouldn't keep a charge for, for the best part of three quarters of the day. So the, the only way I got around that was to do um, a DFU restore, you know, one of these hard yep, restores, yep. the DFU restore, yep. and then restore from an iCloud backup that I'd made. And that cured it. It went perfect. It, it, the battery life went perfectly. Then I installed 5.0.1, and it went back to as it was before. So the battery life just <laughs> fell off again. So last night, I did another DFU restore and restored from my iCloud backup, and it's back to nice. It's good. So mixed results, so, mixed results. Really strange, yeah. really strange. Yeah. I've been, I, you know, I just, I've had unresponsiveness, weird errors. Maybe there's something wrong with the phone. I, it could be. Yeah, I'm not ahead of many people having iPhone, those sort of issues. iPhone 4S. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't want to jump to any conclusions because it, it, it could just be me. And the battery issues that everyone's having is, are so inconsistent anyway. I mean, it's it hard was, to even say what it is. Some people said, oh, as soon as I turned off Find My Friends, then it was better. Or I turned off Location Services. I have all of that stuff turned on. Because yeah, so I the, like to use it, we, and I'm not having issues. Yeah, this is the problem. You don't want to turn off all this functionality that's built into the phone exactly. to cure your battery issues. It should. It's designed to work with all the functions turned on. So switching all these you know random things off to cure it, that's not the way to go. They, yeah, that's not know, a solution. That's right. Uh, any other quick stories before we get to our, uh, our tips and picks? We've still got a lot to go. There's so much to talk about. That, uh, that movie, uh, Steve Jobs, The Lost Interview, there's a trailer online now. You could check that out. Apparently, OS X Lions All My Files icon has Here's to the Crazy Ones hidden in it. Uh, yeah, that's also true of the Teach Text, uh, the, 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 the text edit uh, Text edit's had that icon, icon, yeah. yeah. yeah that, that's, been, that's been there for some time. Um, let's see... I think we, I, you know, I think everything else is kind of uh, a little softer. So we'll let, let, let's take a little break. When we come back, we've got an iOS tip, a Lion tip, and we've got our picks of the week as well. Andy Anako, Sarah Lane, and Don McAllister. I'm Leo Laporte. You're watching Mac Break Weekly, brought to you today by our friends at Smile Software. I'm a big fan of Smile Software. Everybody loves Smile Software. G. McDonald's made friends of everybody in the Mac community. Uh, they make such great software, and they're such great players in the Mac community. They put on at conferences and events. Uh, we'll see them, I'm sure, at uh, the new iWorld, which is the old Mac World iWorld Expo. Uh, in fact, I think we're going to do our meetup again. I'm sure Gene and everybody will be there. And uh, and now, by the way, you can. Uh, I've been using this a lot. I've been doing a lot of forms lately. PDF Pen and PDF Pen Pro. You can get a free demo if you go to PDF, or smilesoftware.com slash MacBreak. This is the best way to open PDFs, edit them, Add text, images, signatures, make corrections, fill out forms. You can merge, delete, and reorder pages. You can redact. You can do so much with PDF Pen and PDF Pen Pro. If you work with PDFs, if you have to fill out forms, this is the way to do it. Tax time's coming. This will be the way to do your taxes with those IRS PDF forms. Um, I use it to sign forms all the time. I keep a library of my signatures, my family's signatures, initials, and so forth, and I just, boom. It, it's like a rubber stamp. You just stamp it, and it's done. PDF Pen is uh, normally fifty nine ninety five, but you can get it for free for thirty days. SmileSoftware dot com slash Mac Break. And uh, if you look at uh, the difference between PDF Pen and PDF Pen Pro, you can see the few extra pl uh, f features like cross platform PDF forms, uh, advanced form features like pop up menus and buttons are in the Pro version. Um, so you can pick the version that uh, that you need. But it is a really fantastic product, and they do such a nice job with it. Try it free right now. Go to smilesoftware.com slash MacBreak. They're also on Facebook if you want to like them. Who doesn't like them? Facebook.com slash smilesoftware. In fact, if we go there, I think they have pictures from their visit to our studios on their uh, Facebook page. On their Facebook page? Yeah. 
Uh, mm. Facebook.com slash Smile Software. Okay. Um, they have some great pictures that we can take a look at. You can mm. make corrections on PDFs, too. And they, by the way, they have an O. I, I, I never, there, yeah, there you go. See, there's their brick. Um, I, I never mentioned this, but they have built in OCR. They have a very good OCR engine. So when you scan stuff or you have an existing PDF, you could turn it into editable text, which is fantastic, or searchable text. Fantastic. Go paperless with PDF Pen and PDF Pen Pro, the affordable PDF toolkits everybody should have. It's really fantastic. Smilesoftware.com slash PDF, uh, MacBreak, I should say. All right, let's uh, move on. It's time for our tips of uh, the week. Now, we don't have Alex here, but I think that we... Well, I was going to do an iOS tip in Alex's absence. Sarah Lane, the queen of iPad today. Well, <laughs> I'm glad it's not you. I am the Sarah queen of iPad today. <laughs> who hosts iPad today? Sarah, do you have a tip? I do. So I don't actually uh, hang out on MacBreak Weekly that often, so I'm not sure if this is something that Alex has covered in the past before, but it's actually something that... I happen to have just figured out recently, and that's when I have a bunch of um, either Gmail accounts or Google Apps accounts that I uh, access through Apple Mail in iOS. That's the, sh the way that I prefer to, um, to manage my email rather than um, going uh, through Google um, in Safari. But one of the things that I like to do, especially in particular threads, is just delete uh, email instead of archive. They're archived by default. Right. So, for example, if yeah, you I don't like that iPad, to archive button. I want to get rid of the spam and stuff like that. Yeah, like so it. it's like we're used to, you know, if you swipe left, you get this nice archive, archive. button, yeah. and that's fine. You press archive, and then it goes into your archive. But a lot of this, I mean, this is a thread about, you know, the problems with our website, and it's like I just want that stuff to go away. I'll deal with archiving when I'm at my computer later. Um, if you just go into settings and then in your mail contacts calendars area, you choose the, I have a few email accounts, but I choose Sarah at twit.tv because that's the one that I'm talking about. All you do is go ahead and instead of archive messages on, switch it to off. Oh. Yeah. And then you say done. And it will say delete now and that? Yeah. So when you go back oh, to the that's mail. That's so cool. Yeah. That's so not now, intuitive though. Delete. So Love that. It, that's a little, you might not be able the to read it, but I assure archived. you it says delete. The default so is archive, so yeah. it's nice to have delete. Instead. So it's just it's just something that you might you might know about it, but if you didn't, it's a, it's a nice little handy tip to have. Nice little tip. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate that. Andy, you have an, a, a, a lion, a lion, <laughs> <laughs> Mac OS tip for us? Exactly. Uh, in the Finder, when you hit Command N, you get a brand new Finder window, and it normally takes you to all my files. That big everything you own in one big one big squishy pile uh, list box. Uh, if you go into Finder Preferences, not Preferences for System, but the actual Finder Preferences underneath the uh, file menu, uh, you will find that there's actually a preference to define what the default content of a new window should be. So if you want it to ha be your home folder, if you want it to be your pictures folder, or any other arbitrary folder like your Dropbox folder, you can just set it right there. So every time you hit Command N, you will be taken not to just an empty window, but exactly the, the area that you think that every single new window should oh, be focused on. that nice? Hey, I figured out why you couldn't see my screen. Oh. It wasn't mirrored. You should be able to see it now. Okay. Can Let you? See. Is this no. where we... No? <laughs> Damn! I'm, I actually did go to it right now, and it's still... Still blue. It's still black now. Now, now I black. don't have any picture. We're making some progress. <laughs> <laughs> now it's black. It was blue. Uh, well, no, actually, it used to have some color in it. Now it has no color in it. Color. Can you see it now? No, now it's just one big pixel. Nothing. I'm trying. I'm sorry. <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. I was on. just going to show what Andy's tip. I know. I wanted. It's yeah. very nice. In the Finder preferences, new Finder windows show, and you can make it any folder. Is that the is that the tip, Andy? That is the tip. That is the tip. You can figure that out. I don't think that's I clearly did an excellent job describing the feature. You did, because I immediately grokked it, as the kids say. I um, am an education professional. <laughs> All right, time for our picks of the week. Let's start with Mr. Don McAllister. Um, okay, uh, this is actually, this, this sort of uh, harks back to what we were talking about before and HTML5 and video. Um, when I was creating the, uh, the support pages for the Mac Store app, uh, I wanted to put a small video in the web page. And normally on Screencast Online, I, I normally only sort of uh, have Apple users, so I, just MP4 files are normally fine for me. But we discovered that people using Chrome and people using uh, different browsers couldn't actually access the video. Uh, so what I had to do was create three different types of video and embed them into the HTML5 
tag. But how to create those videos, there's a, an application called Miro Converter or Miro Video Converter, oh. which is a free app on the Mac App Store. And basically, it'll take any, virtually any file and convert it into lots of other different types of files. And, and the one I needed to do was Og Theora, which I think was for uh, Chrome or for Firefox. And then also WebM as well, which I think was Opera. I needed uh, that particular type of file. So this is a very simple video conversion utility. Uh, as I say, you can take a single file, it will export it into these standard formats now so that you can embed them in your HTML5, HTML5 tags. And then no matter which browser the people are actually using, they will always see the video. And uh, that page is over at screencastonline.com slash MAS. You can actually see it in action over there. That's the, the encoded video. Neat. Mm -hmm. Theora, WebM. Yep. And, All uh, sorts. H and also support. for different devices as well. Yeah, very handy. So this kind of takes the place of... Uh, what was that old that program video? There was Video Hub. Video used Hub, all yeah. The time? Visual, Visual Hub. Visual Hub. Visual Hub. Yeah. I mean, I still use Handbrake for my standard encoding, but this is great just for these uh, weird and wacky different formats yeah. that you need for HTML5. Yeah. I mean, I think it's probably very comparable to Visual Hub. That's cool. Mm -hmm. uh, let's. I I'll tell you what, because uh, I'm. Uh, uh, I think we should let. Uh, the, I think we should. Uh, Sarah Lane, <laughs> do you have a pick? Are you nervous? I'm very nervous. I don't, I don't know very many women, and. So it's for I don't me. Really count. It's very exciting. yeah. I, I have a tip, and this is um, this is actually something that you can access in Safari, Yay. although you can access it really from from any uh, browser. Mm -hmm. And it used to be more of an iOS kind of a fun thing, and that's Foursquare. Foursquare has a whole new new Foursquare desktop type oh. of experience. Uh, they just How turned cool. it on uh, this morning. And at first I thought, well, I never access Foursquare from my Look computer. That. Why do I even need this? And I realized that I didn't because there was really nothing there. Right. Foursquare was sort of, a, it's that a, had it was no a portable sort of, thing. Yeah. yeah, no browser experience uh, could be this. seen. Now what you've got is, so I, I've logged in and you've got, a, a, you know, this is where I've checked in last, which was Twit Brick House Studios and, and my friends who are all sorts of other places. I also have people that I may know and, and it depends on who of my friends are connected to them. So in many cases, it's it's people that I do want to connect to. Daniel Burke, I, I have no idea why I'm not his Foursquare friend, so I can go ahead and just easily ask to add him as a friend. Lists from my friends, and that's something that I Foursquare, love the new list. I do too. I, I, I get a lot out of it. Um, Veronica Belmont has SF Pizza. She mm. has eight places in one of her pizza lists. So that's wow. something that's, um, I've probably been to all those places, but let's say it was a new city. I would get something out of that. But up at the top, here's where it really gets cool. So I have geolocated myself in Petaluma. Here we are at the brick house and you know, we're near the water. Right. That's me. And they have color coded certain things like um, it'll say suggestions for Tuesday at 12.57 p.m. because that's actually when I loaded this page. It's now 102 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Because it's still lunch, Foursquare is now suggesting places where I might have lunch type items. They're telling me to go to a food truck. They're telling me to go to High Tech Burrito, which oh, is right down the street. Interesting. Yeah, and then you have color coded. So there's uh, there's featured places. There are places that are trending. So you see those places in blue. I also see people who are checked in near me. Eileen is actually checked in right. She's checked into the same place as me, so she's actually right in the she's back. On top of you. But yeah. I, am, I assure you, we're in the same place. Here we are. There's there. there's Eileen. Yeah. Uh, and then I can click on little places and figure out, uh, you know, a little bit more about them. Oval Corp, uh, I don't know. There's a photo of a pineapple there. They can't be all bad. I really like this. And then, of course, I've got my little notifications, which is similar to how it works on iOS. And if I click on that, I see that, you know, I have a few friends' requests. It actually makes Foursquare something that I will load up in my browser rather than never even going through the trouble in the past. So I'm into it. you engaged and married since we met you This last? is my right hand, not my left. Okay, just checking. <laughs> yeah, big dummy. Just checking. Well, it, it looks like you've got an engagement and a wedding ring well, on your right hand. What does that mean? An engagement ring is usually not made of peridot, which is a semi-precious stone. <laughs> all right. So I can't tell. What do I know? I'm not engaged. What do I know? That's all you need to I know. I think your fingers are turning blue, though. You might want to get some <laughs> oxygen. Uh, let <laughs> No, They're turning turquoise, <laughs> turquoise by design. All right. All right. Uh, I think it's time for Andy Anatko's pick of the week. 
Uh, my pick is the new version of Pixelmator, which just got upgraded to version 2.0. Uh, it is one of the, the Acorn and Pixelmator are, are the two nicest Mac specific image editors uh, you can get. Uh, if you've got 500 bucks, you want Photoshop. Uh, if you don't got 500 bucks, you want one of these two. Uh, and of the two, Pixelmator is my favorite. They tend to, they, 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 they're both like sort of updated rather regularly. Uh, and right now, Pixelmator, I think, is at the top of the heap. They added enough. Uh, it, it, most of what they added was making it uh, line compatible. So you get versioning, you get full screen mode, you get all the sort of stuff. The interface is so, they so truly followed the lead uh, of Apple's other apps like uh, like Final Cut, like Aperture, like iPhoto, that if you're using uh, this $30 app just as an image editor, just as the, as the app that in iPhoto gets launched whenever you decide you want to edit something, instead of just using those, you know, dinky little sliders that, that iPhoto gives you, go into a real uh, image editor, you will almost feel as though you're still in the Apple uh, Apple world because it all just works together so very, very well. But it supports all of the good features of Photoshop that makes Photoshop editing worth it, uh, like uh, layers, uh, filters. Uh, they've added a lot of support for content-aware fills. So if you're, in a, if you're editing a picture and there's a... Uh, the, Honeymoon picture is really, really great, except for this really stupid paraglider who's like advertising Cuervo uh, in the in the sky above, you know, your wife's head. You can just select it, do a content-aware fill, and it will basically paint in sky and clouds so that the, that thing suddenly becomes invisible. Uh, it's a long, long list of things that they've added, but the. Above all, the character of this upgrade is that they've turned it from a Mac Paint clone into a Photoshop clone. Uh, it was always, 1.0 was always a very, very good editor, but it was missing a handful of those special tools like for uh, blurring, sponging, just uh, advanced type, advanced paths. If you want to add, the, if you want to add like path selections or add like graphics uh, into, into an image, that sort of was the thick line between the stuff that this $30 app can do and stuff that a $500 uh, app can do. Right now, I think the Pixelmator is the app that you, you choose because it's what most people are going to need if they just want to do something simple uh, ed to edit a photo where the photo is pretty good, but you just wish that the eyes in the face were a little bit brighter so that they weren't quite so hidden by shadow. Well, just double click on it in iPhoto. You've set Pixelmator as your image editor for this app. Uh, and so you just simply do a very, very quick, clean, smart selection of just the eye area, add in a adjustment layer so that you can quickly just make exposure and color changes just to that selected area. And then once you're done, you get dumped back into iPhoto with your changes intact. Uh, I don't, uh, right now it's, it's, it's just been available for the past couple of weeks, this new upgrade. Uh, they say that it's a, a time limited discount of twenty nine ninety nine, but it's a great 30 bucks to spend. If you don't have a real image editor on your Mac yet, chiefly because you've been scared off of, uh, of uh, Photoshop's price tag, I think Mac users, real Mac users can be very, very happy with Pixelmator. Now, I uh, bought one, oh, but I guess there's probably not an upgrade uh, deal, huh? Oh, I think it's, I think there is actually, if, if, well, if you haven't actually already bought it through the App Store, I'm right. not sure if there's an upgrade. Yeah, yeah, you see, that's the problem. Yeah, right, exactly. Because I bought it, you know, when it was just, when there was no App Store. Yeah, it's worth it. 30 bucks. Well, it's worth, worth 30 it. bucks. Absolutely. Again, very, very pretty, very, very slick, very, very yeah. nicely produced piece yeah. of software. And, and instead of Photoshop. Thank mm -hmm. you, Andy and Inotco. Uh, I had a pick. I was going to show the up band, but I think uh, we'll save that for another day. What do you say? Uh, but I do like it. It's pretty cool. Well, you that's a tease breakfast. if I ever heard one. Yeah. You, you I, talked I, about I love my tip. Yeah. You talked yeah. about it on Twitter. I know, and I and it's going to be a, a, a Gizwiz uh, one next week. Go ahead, Annie. You had you had lunch with somebody, breakfast with them? Yeah, I, as a matter of fact, I had breakfast with a couple of people, and one of them had the up band, and he showed it to me and said, "Wow, that's good, kind of cool. That's that's how it puts date in the iPhone. That's pretty slick. Oh God dang, that's a wonderful look. Can I see it? Oh well, yeah, so. well, and it, you know, the reason it's a pick is because it, you have to have an iPhone to use it. Uh, because there's a free iPhone app, and otherwise it does absolutely... It's a pedometer that does absolutely nothing. But I like it. Just so, just so happens, Leo. You're wearing one, too. <laughs> okay, well, all right, then I'm going to do it. Now, all let me, right, let me just say something, email those guys and get one. Let me just say something, though. Uh, the, 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 you, you can see that Don has a nice little cap on his plug at the one end. Mine has yes. fallen off, and I think they fall off very easily. Uh, I'm told that they will give you one for free, and then after you lose your first one... Uh, after you lose your second one, then you have to buy them, but they're not very expensive. And that plugs into the iPhone. What do you, Here, I'll you get you. on a list as the guy who's asked for three <laughs> yeah, now, and now you, them. you don't <laughs> get I anymore? I lost mine. I'm going to look, look around for it because I think I lost it here. <laughs> I know you. I You're had it on Twitter. 
Anyway, um, so what it is, it's a band, it's a pedometer, just like the Fitbit. Remember the Fitbit? Um, it march, watches your, uh, your, your uh, movements and records your steps, but it also records your sleep patterns like the Fitbit did. Uh, did. And uh, you take pictures of your food. It has a nice iPhone app. And unlike the Fitbit, the Fitbit would just uh, wirelessly sync with your Mac and had a website. This, you plug into the audio jack of your iPhone, which is kind of interesting, and then it has a, a special sync button. Let's go back to the top here. And it's just it, like loading in basic programs on your Apple too. Yeah, just plug I'm sure into the audio jack, press well, play. This is how the square works as well. So obviously there is, you know, there's a, apparently a well-known way to do audio uh, transfer. The Motion X hardware in here was developed by Philippe Kahn, the guy who did uh, Borland Pascal. Um, and so now it's it's in here. I just put in my most recent steps. I take pictures of my food, and that goes in there too. And you can see your sleep cycles, uh, which have not been very good. One thing I did <laughs> notice. Um, that I just, for instance, was at the gym. It, it saw me rowing, but this whole area is on a Stairmaster. Didn't see that. Aww. So that's not so good, right? That, you want to uh, be rewarded for all your I hard work. I did a lot of steps in there, and it <laughs> thinks I was just sitting on my behind. Um, so that's not so good. But, uh, but uh, you know, and I think that that's because a wrist band is not going to do as well as a pedometer as a hip-based uh, device. On the other hand, I keep losing the Fitbit. This one is going to be a lot harder to uh, lose. I like it. I, Don, you like it? Yeah, the, the food thing doesn't quite, um, I, th I think they need to make the food part of it a bit better because just taking photos and then asking you questions about it doesn't really do it for me. Uh, it's waterproof as well, so I've used it, although it says uh, it's waterproof Up down to, to one meter. Yeah. Yeah, and it does, they do say don't use it for swimming, although I think they've changed their mind. I think they said it was okay for swimming, but now it's not. But I've tried it swimming, it's fine. But uh, I like the sleep, the sleep pattern things. And you can also set the smart alarm so that it will wake you up at the Ooh, right part of your sleep cycle. I forgot to mention that. Yeah, it buzzes yeah. when you're in your light sleep cycle so you don't wake up when you're in a deep sleep. Yeah, uh, and there's also an inactivity timer so that if yeah. you're inactive for 15 minutes or something, it will vibrate on your wrist to remind you to go and... <laughs> Take uh, a walk. <laughs> yeah. there, there's a social aspect to it too. People can give you challenges. Uh, you can see how other people are sleeping and doing. Uh, which is kind of fun. Don, I'm going to follow you on here. I'll make you one of my uh, yeah. my, my uh, buddies. $99. Uh -huh. I think this is, you know, the whole idea is to motivate you to stay in shape, to get mm -hmm. a good night's sleep, to eat right. Uh, the fact that you're taking pictures of your food and then record how you felt afterwards. You're right. I mean, it's not a calorie counter, but it does yeah. make you more aware of what you're eating mm -hmm. if you have True. to take a picture of everything. So I, I don't think that's so bad. Uh, I, this, I think it's very interesting, you know. Um, it's fun. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's called the up from Jawbone. I wasn't going to pick it, but I guess I have. There you go. <laughs> uh, I like it, and uh, we'll see. You know, anything that, that helps me uh, get more exercise and eat right is a good thing. Uh, Don McAllister is at Screencasts Online. Don't forget, he's got mm -hmm. that new T. Or what is it? S C O Tutor. S C O Tutor for Lion. For Lion, you can find that in the yes. App Store or uh, get your screencasts there at Screencasts Online. Com. Thanks for being here, Don. No, thanks We're for inviting Sarah me. Lane go over to the TNT set where she's going to get ready for Tech News Today. today That's very at true. 2 30 Pacific, 5 30 Eastern, our daily news show with Tom Merritt and I as Actar. She's also the host of The Social Hour on Mondays and iPad Today on Thursdays. With you. And we have a lot of fun. I think it's a great show if you're an iPad owner or you're interested, want to know more about we the iPad. We even have a lot of people who say, don't even have an iPad yet, want to. But don't. Should we, should we add, I still like the show. Should we add Kindle Fire coverage to our show? No. <laughs> I think that's a different show. show. That's, Are that's you going to do that in All About Android? Just, oh, yeah. This is not an Android device. It's just a delusion, an illusion. You think that's an Android device? It's got, yes. I, I, I eventually, do. we'll probably have to have some crossover show between our show yeah. and All About Android. I'm the only one getting but it. But for now, but you should All right. You should all right. Cover. So watch All About Android. Well, it's got uh, Android apps. So. Right. That's true. That's true. Andy Anako is at the Chicago Sun Times, where he works with Roger Ebert, and uh, <laughs> his, his, uh, and others, and many, many others. Winter, winterizing homes. If you want, if you got single glaze, we'll hang the plastic and double glaze them for you. And the price is going to be. I right. just want to go with you and Roger to Steak and Shake. That's all I want to do. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Andy. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you next time. Got to get back to work. Break time's over. <laughs>